as they express it mathematically, maps one to one onto something real in the subatomic world. That's the claim of the scientific realists. The instrumentalists, though, they say no. What they see, what what they see, is an entity, the quark, which is semiotic, not real, semiotic. It exists as a formula. It exists as a computer simulation. It exists as a description in a textbook. It exists as a definition in a published paper in a physics journal. But that's all that can be said. It cannot be said that it exists as a real subatomic particle. This conceptual nature of the quark or the semiotic nature of the quark is very important because it does enable predictions to be made about the behaviour of objects in the subatomic world. And that's why it is created. We create the formula, so the instrumentalists say, we create the formula which defines the quark, explains the quark's relation to the neutron, let, let's say. We do that not in order to say something true, but in order to make a prediction about something observable in the world. We do it, if you like, to assert power, to assert power over the natural world right, through our capacity to predict the behaviour of the, of, the, of the world and manipulate the behaviour of the world as they do in atom-smashing machines, as they do in fusion and as they do in fission and, and so forth. So you can see why here that anti-realism is sometimes... This form of anti-realism is called instrumentalism. It regards scientific theories like quarks and electrons and so forth as instruments for helping us to predict observable phenomena in the observable world and to make up stories, if I could put it that way, to make up stories, to make up concepts about the unobservable world that to enable us to make predictions about the observable world and in order to understand the observable world. So there's a fundamental difference here between the instrumentalists and the realists. The realists are making truth claims. The instrumentalists are saying that the aim of science is not to determine the truth but to, to determine rules or laws or models that enable predictions to be made. And whether the model of the quark and the neutron and what have you, whether this model is truthful is beside the point. The point is that it enables us to make computers. The point is that it enables us to understand the growth of a tree. The point is that it enables us to make you know, electron microscopes, to make uh, scanning machines for cancer and so on. We have these scientists doing their daily work, their day-to-day -day work. They're not interested in truth, according to the instrumentalists, and they don't mean that in an insulting way at all. They don't mean to be insulting at all. They're saying they're not interested in truth, they're interested in solving a problem. A problem that's to do with um, semiconduct semiconductors or a problem that's to do with subatomic particles or a problem that's to do with trees. That's what they're, that's what they're there to do. They're not there uh, to find the truth. And this whole business about science, you know, this whole business about the scientific realists, you know, going off on this fact-finding mission, this truth-finding mission, they say is a distraction. So, that's the instrumentalist view. But can I ask, do a straw poll here? I, I understand most of you are computer scientists. Do you see yourselves as problem solvers or do you see yourselves as seekers of truthfulness about reality? 
H hands up. Who's a problem solver? Hands up. Who seeks to know the truth about a reality? Maybe one, maybe one person. Yeah. Excuse me, I'll just have a sip of tea and then we'll continue. Um, okay, so there's some philosophers who challenge scientific realism on the basis of problems with induction and underdetermination and so on. And then you get a whole lot of their co the colleagues of scientific realism, their fellow biologists and chemists who are instrumentalists, and they're offering an alternative to scientific realism. Then we have this chap here, Thomas Kuhn, whom you've all heard of, I'm sure, who offers another alternative, if you like, to scientific realism. He published his highly influential book, The Structure of Scientific, uh, Scientific Revolutions, and it caused, uh, it, it would be you know, one of the most influential books uh, ever written, I, I dare, dare suggest. Uh, a very influential book, although, and you'll be tired of hearing me say this, although Kuhn is now you know, not so highly regarded as he was at the time and he's been subject to, his work has been subject to a lot of criticism. But still, it was a, a very, very influential book. I've even heard people say to me that it changed their life. It was a book that changed their whole way of thinking about their work and about the reality of, of, of their work. What Kuhn did was um, partly historical and partly philosophical. He looked at mainly physics and mainly between the 17th century and the early 20th century. He's been criticised for this, actually, um, because of his focus on physics and the argument that's made is that if he had chosen to study oceanography, for example, or geology, for example, he would have not been able to arrive at the model that he arrived at. That the model that he arrived at of the scientific paradigm is pretty much restricted to physics and pretty much restricted to fundamental physics at that. So it's got limited scope, the critics of Kuhn claim. But I'm getting ahead of myself. What am I talking here? What am I talking about with this notion of a paradigm? Kuhn argued that his long study of uh, several hundred years of scientific work, uh, mainly in physics, illustrated a reoccurring pattern of events. What the, this reoccurring pattern of events was where we had where we have long periods of relative stability that he termed a paradigm and, uh, and that he termed normal science and, and, and was a paradigm, uh, constituted a paradigm. The, these long periods of normal science are periods in which um, lecturers at universities give their lectures in an unproblematic way. They're able to tell the students what the facts are and what the facts are not. They're able to assess PhD theses and master's theses in an unproblematic way as either contributing to the truth or not contributing to the truth, that, there are, there, that, that, that the existence of problems are still there, of course, and that's why students are writing PhD, uh, PhD thesis, and that's why people are still publishing papers, but they're more puzzles than problems. They're, just, they're really filling in a few gaps 
just extending truth a little bit more here and a little bit more there and making a little bit of a correction here and a little bit of a correction there and recolouring it a little bit in this way, etc. This is normal science, according to Kuhn. This is the paradigm. And we can see what the paradigm of knowledge is in periods of normal science very easily. Just go to any university library, take out the textbook that's used in 101, uh, Physics 101, Biology 101, Chemistry 101. Look at that textbook and that tells you the state of knowledge according to the paradigm. Okay? So for long periods of time, according to Kuhn, we have this normal science prob puzzle doing but a consensus, an agreement about the fundamentals of the, of the situation. So we had that under Newton. For a couple of hundred years, we had it under Newton. We had it under Einstein for, for 50, 60, 70 years. We had it too before, if you go back before, you know, we had it under Plato and so on um, as, as well. Okay? So th this, is, this is normal science in the paradigm. Okay, then according to Kuhn, what we get is we get a split. We get a situation where the puzzles are no longer just little puzzles, they're real problems. They're, they're causing you know, genuine difficulties for the paradigm, for the knowledge paradigm a, 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 as it exists. And through a complex, a, a, a complex process that is more social than knowledge-based, through a complex process, what we see is greater and greater, more and more successful attacks on the paradigm, critiques on it. Cracks start to open up. Genuine weaknesses in the foundations of it um, become apparent. And as a consequence, we have what Kuhn called a scientific revolution a shift from one paradigm to another paradigm. This shift is dramatic. The shift, for example, uh, from Newtonian physics to relativist physics and then to quantum physics. A very, very major shifts. Revolutions. Genuine revolutions. Genuine paradigm shifts. So, uh, so Kuhn argued and so many other people argued. And this is where the weakness I pointed out earlier, that it's much more difficult to find similar shifts in other disciplines, like oceanography, for example. Now, I don't know about computer science. Perhaps in discussion at the end, you, you might like to give me some suggestions as to whether computer science has undergone similar paradigm shifts, uh, similar revolutions. Uh, maybe a shift from, I'm not a computer scientist so I'm guessing here, but, but maybe a shift from, um, from <coughs> symbolic algorithms to object-oriented programming. A shift from a language like Lisp as the, the main technique or the main tool of artificial intelligence um, through to neural nets as the main tool or a main tool of artificial intelligence. Perhaps something like that constitutes a paradigm shift, but, but perhaps it doesn't. That's, you know much more about that than I do. We, we'll come back to that um, during discussion. Now the point about these paradigm shifts is that it's not just progress in science. Kuhn says. Now, in a way, it is progress in science, but, but the important point